morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this morning's outing to explore the Elmwood in Berkeley, uh, which just so happens to be where our executive, executive director, Amanda Brown Stevens, lived in her college years. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm the director of marketing and communications at Greenbelt Alliance. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. And the work we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and agricultural lands, while also creating thriving communities, um, as well as this free outings program, is made possible by you. So please donate today if you can, um, which you can do so securely on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash donate. Um, and during the outing, please feel free to ask questions and we will answer them at the end just for efficiency's sake. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Ken, our wonderful outings coordinator, who will uh, get us going. Do you Thank want the you. second slide now? Oh, go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Okay. Good thing Jesse has that down by heart. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, welcome. We've been doing these uh, virtual outings since February. Bob actually let off. And um, we have a few more scheduled. In two weeks, we'll have a, a, an outing on um, uh, the Peregrine Falcons in uh, uh, Diablo Foothills and Mount Diablo State Park and, and Shell Ridge open space. And also maybe talk a little bit about the geology of that interesting area. And then in March, we'll have a, a wildflower walk and then a, a visionary plant walk, which uh, should be great. And then Bob's promised to follow up with another wildflower walk in April to correct all the mistakes I make in, uh, no, no, no. in my March presentation. So anyway, uh, many of you know Bob Johnson. He's been, uh, he's a member of our, our board of directors and has been for many, many years. It's 1991, right, Bob? 91 or 92, yeah. And also one of our great outings leaders. Um, He's also worked with Urban Advantage to produce photorealistic visual visualizations of better urban design. Previously worked for many years as a security analyst in Japan, as well as the Bay Area. And with Janet Byron, another outings leader and former board member, he co-wrote the book, Berkeley Walks, featuring self-guided urban tours. With that, I'll throw it over to you, Bob. Thank you, and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, as Ken noted, today's walk is based on uh, the book Berkeley Walks, and it's actually Walk 12 in the second edition of Berkeley Walks, uh, which Janet Byer and I did, was published in 2015 and the second edition in 2018. Um, and it's been expanded to from 18 to 21 self-guided tours. Um, and there's lots of interesting information on uh, terms and architectural styles and so on. Um, so uh, today's walk on the Elmwood has an emphasis on uh, architecture um, of, that's very diverse and fascinating in this neighborhood and where some famous people live that I think you're going to find quite uh, intriguing uh, and also a bit about street trees and so on. Well the Elmwood is a very walkable area with tree-lined sidewalks, shops, homes and schools all in close proximity and further served by transit. This is fairly typical of early 20th century urban development However, after World War II, American development was very auto-oriented with commercial areas, places of employment, schools, and homes, all widely separated with wide streets and no sidewalks and little if any transit service that made it difficult to do anything without getting in the car. During COVID, people are actually out walking more and in neighborhoods such as this, they can walk out the front door and don't need to get in their cars to take a stroll. There are also apartment buildings well integrated with single family homes and duplexes. Greenbelt Alliance promotes such resilient neighborhoods throughout its work. Well, we start at the Northwest corner of College Avenue and Ashby Avenue here where there's the circle with the arrow in it. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, follow the, uh, the red on, as, as our route um, so that we're going to uh, loop around uh, this way and then make a 
second loop, but we'll cross over will be first on the west side of College Avenue, and then be looping around on the east side of College Avenue and, and back to our starting point. Um, in all, it's, uh, it's pretty flat, but it's three and a half miles. Uh, however, thanks of, to the wonders of virtuality, we're gonna try and do it in less than an hour. Well, before 1900, this area was, uh, uh, was not terribly heavily populated. Um, and then in, uh, there, was, there was not much development, a few houses. Um, but then in 1903, um, there was an electric streetcar that was on uh, College Avenue. And in 1905, uh, groundbreaking was done for the Elmwood Park uh, subdivision, uh, which was uh, marked by uh, stone gates um, at the Northeast and Southeast corners of College and Ashby uh, of this intersection. And here's, here's an example of one of those. Um, in 1906, the San Francisco earthquake spurred the rapid development of the residential area and its commercial center along College Avenue as San Francisco fled to what they thought was safer ground, um, not knowing about the Hayward Fault on the East Bay side. The Elmwood has a compact but robust local shopping district, uh, partly due to neighborhood pressure on city zoning rules to limit the number of restaurants so that diverse retail businesses can also thrive. So in addition to numerous restaurants and cafes with Chinese, Indian, Mediterranean, burritos, et cetera, the generally non-chain re retail stores sell groceries, books, toys, clothing, jewelry, wine, gifts, and more. Although College Avenue is a busy thoroughfare, the pedestrian ambiance is pleasant thanks to the street trees, which are ginkgos that turn a brilliant uh, golden yellow in the autumn. Um, and uh, for example, parked cars, which act as a buffer uh, between pedestrians and the moving traffic, um, and that there are um, a, a, a whole line of windows and, and doorways uh, right up to the sock, sidewalk, creating a good pedestrian space. Well, at, at the corner where we're starting our tour, um, there's a Colonial Revival mixed-use building uh, this is on the northwest corner of College and Aspie Avenue, which has uh, shops on the first floor and there could be apartments or offices on the second floor. Um, built around 1907, it's uh, likely the oldest surviving building in this commercial area, according to the Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association or Baja. Um, and it's attractive second floor bays uh, and the ornamentation are, are quite attractive and it, it uh, benefited from a re major renovation in 2008. Walter Ratcliffe Jr. designed the Landmark Mercantile Trust Company of 1925 across the street. It's now the Wells Fargo Bank. Um, this is 2959 College. Radcliffe was best known uh, for ecclesiastical architecture, often in Tudor Gothic style. Uh, but this elements includes uh, elements of mission revival with uh, uh, massive or uh, uh, with lavish ornamentation around the entry in, in the middle arch. Well, let's start walking. We're gonna cross Ashby uh, going south uh, with the hills are up to our left and walk to 2966 College Avenue. This is the Rialto Cinemas Elmwood. Originally the Strand, uh, the movie theater was built in 1914 in a Prairie School design, uh, but was remodeled in 1947 to its current streamlined modern style. It offers an eclectic mix of movies and live broadcasts. Um, so this neighborhood movie theater has survived in the area of multiplexes and we hope it can survive COVID. Uh, a plaque next door at 2980 College um, marks the original location of Berkeley Repertory Theater, which had its early productions here from 1968 and then moved uh, to the current Addison's uh, Street site around 1980. Across the street is a commercial building that is a, uh, a row of shops uh, at 27, uh, 2979 to 93 College Avenue. And each commercial storefront is outlined in this uh, bright colored uh, floral uh, terracotta. Uh, the Claire story, which are up, these are the windows up here, uh, have delicate mullions and there's also uh, a variety of colored tiles uh, under the shop windows and in the, in the entrance way. Well, let's continue to 2992 to 98 College. It's a retail building from 1922 with, with large arches and there are these high uh, Claire story windows and very colorful tiles. Now the rug store that's here claims that it has been here since 1922. 
um, I think you're going to be very hard pushed to find other businesses in Berkeley that have been in the same place for about 100 years, uh, even assuming a change in ownership. Well, we're going to turn right on Webster Street now and get into the residential area. Oh, and on the left side, uh, in front of uh, a house, uh, there is this uh, display uh, about uh, the post office and it's it's been put up uh, because the owner feels that um, the US Postal Service has been under threat uh, lately and it would like to see make sure that uh, it is maintained. Uh, we will continue on down uh, Webster Street and then turn around right on Benvenue and on Benvenue uh, toward uh, the end of the block um, is the Claremont branch of the Berkeley Public Library at 2940 Benvenue. It was designed by uh, James Playtech, who's pictured here, in 1924. Uh, his firm also did uh, the main and north branch libraries. Um, an addition uh, was added uh, during a major, major renovation of the building in 2012. Okay, we're gonna have to cross Ashby very carefully in the crosswalk uh, because traffic can be fairly heavy. Um, and then we're gonna immediately turn left and walk two blocks along Ashby Street to Regent Street and look kind of uh, catty corner across uh, to see the, um, uh, the hospital uh, complex that's there. Um, and this, I think, is the uh, is medical office building and the hospital building itself is, is behind that, as I remember. Well, um, the, the hospital originally started with Nurse Alta Alice Minor Bates. Um, who founded the Alta Bates Sanatorium on Dwight Way in 1905 in an old Victorian house that's still there. Uh, it offered eight beds to care for women and their infants. Uh, development of this campus on Ashby, um, which is, and the campus now known as Alta Bates Summit Medical Center, uh, began in 1907. Um, so this is the original uh, historic building of the hospital. Um, in 1928, this was replaced by a six-story building um, and then in uh, 1985, uh, the current modern structure was, was put up in, in place of this. Well, Alta Bates was a nurse and she was one of the first uh, anesthet uh, nurse anesthetists um, in the Bay Area. Um, and she also had a nurse's school as part of the hospital uh, where hundreds of, of nurses were trained. Um, she was head of the hospital uh, until her retirement in 1949. Um, in 2000, the Alta Bates uh, medical complex merged with Oakland Summit Medical Center and Sutter Health um, and the combined uh, not-for-profit uh, medical center though um, at the Berkeley location, location has been specializing in birthing, mental health, and emergency care. But they've been talking about closing down the most of the hospital services in 2030. Um, the Berkeley community has been uh, opposed to this and I would think the recent COVID pandemic um, indicates that maybe it's not a good idea to be closing down hospitals. Well, we're going to turn right uh, on uh, Regent Street um, and continue uh, to this house, um, which is at, um, let's see what's this, 2901 Regent. Um, this is um, a house on the corner and it was designed by uh, a very talented architect named A. Dodge Copland. Um, unfortunately, and he, uh, he died in 1908 at the age of only 39. Um, he had gone on an outing uh, with a young woman. Uh, he was divorced at the time. And on the return towards Berkeley, uh, supposedly he had to get out and crank up the car um, and a, a pistol in his pocket fell out and fatally shot him. So uh, by uh, falling out, it fatally went, went off and fatally shot him by accident. Uh, so the story goes, although there there are there is speculation that maybe it was a jealous boyfriend uh, of the young woman or, or some other cause. Um, in any case, it's an interesting house in Brown Shingle. It has these brackets and the ends of the beams that look kind of like uh, jigsaw pieces. Uh, we'll see some more of his work later. Well, let's cross over Russell and then later turn left on Oregon Street. Um, Oregon Street ends at Regent Street. Uh, on the left at 2430 Oregon, um, oh, I'm sorry, before we get to that organ, I wanted to show you these pictures. Um, along Regent Street and other parts of the Elmwood, um, there are a number of both pink and white uh, flowering ornamental plum, um, as well as uh, both deciduous and uh, evergreen magnolia trees. 
Um, so right now is a good time to take a walk in the Elmwood and other places because a lot of the trees are, are just now coming into full flower. I just took these three pictures uh, a few days ago. Um, so it's a good, a good time to go out and see the trees. Okay, we're gonna turn left on Oregon. And uh, in front of this house at 2430, there's another uh, magnolia, a, a white magnolia. Um, now this house was actually uh, the home for a number of years uh, of the artist Chiura Obata, who taught at uh, UC and was celebrated, he'd come to the US as a teenager. Uh, he was celebrated for his introduction of Japanese art techniques and aesthetics to the United States. Uh, both in his teaching and by example in his prints and paintings. Um, Obata was a keen observer of nature um, and he uh, promoted a blending of Japanese and Western techniques. He also did lots of illustrations in uh, American national parks. Um, this uh, watercolor here was done in 1942 and unfortunately Obata, like so many other Japanese Americans, um, was forced to go to internment camps during World War II. And I believe this is a watercolor he did there and that's probably the internment camp with, with the mountain in the background. He continued to paint and teach while in the internment and, and later went back, came back to Berkeley though, when, which is when he lived in this house. His wife Haruko Kohashi was a noted Japanese uh, teacher of Ikebana flower arranging. And his son, Gyo Obata, is an architect who co-founded the global architecture engineering firm of Helmuth Obata and Kasabom, uh, HOK, um, which, um, when I was, uh, he, Gil Ogdaba lived in St. Louis where I grew up. And uh, I can remember uh, driving around to show people his impressive uh, contemporary style house. He's, um, he's still alive and maybe still acting a bit uh, as an architect um, after, uh, after many years. A little farther down across the street at 2421 Oregon, we find a neoclassical house with large columns that looks like a, a plantation mansion that's somehow been transported to Berkeley. Now, next to that on the left is a less flamboyant brown shingle house at 2419 Oregon. From 1955 to 1964, though, it was the home of film critic Pauline Kael. Petaluma born and a graduate of UC Berkeley, Kael managed the two screen cinema guild at Telegraph Avenue and Hay Street, uh, which is no longer there, unfortunately, but uh, she showed American and European films that were rarely seen elsewhere. From 1968 to 1991, she was a film critic for the New Yorker magazine. She had a profound influence on American attitudes toward cinema. Um, and this is a book about her. It's the cover shown here. Um, inside are some murals by San Francisco artist Jess Collins and recently looked like they're renovating the building. So I hope they're gonna pre preserve the murals. Well, let's return to Regent and turn left. On the corner 28, 12, 14 Regent is a large brown shingle house with uh, steep gables, a big window and has these uh, brackets with ornamental uh, leaves on them. I think they're probably a cantha, it's supposed to be a canthus leaves. Um, this house was uh, moved from Telegraph in 1949, Telegraph Avenue, when Berkeley purchased numerous properties to accommodate the expansion of the play areas for Willard Middle School. It always seems to me amazing that houses as big as this uh, could, could be just moved from one spot to another. Um, in any case, let's continue north on Regent. We're gonna cross Stewart Street and then the street ends in a circle and we continue uh, on a pathway that goes between uh, Willard Middle School on the left, a public school found in 1916. And on the left are some tennis courts and, and Willard Park, which we'll see later. When we get to Derby Street, we look right and here is this cast cement mosaic wall produced by Andrew Worvey as a community project in 1978. And the, I believe there's all bits of, of ceramics and, and shells and, and various things uh, embedded in, in this rather entertaining wall. Well, we cross Derby Street in the cross, crosswork and continue north on the left side of the region, which kind of jog, the street jogs a bit here to the west. On the left, uh, farther along, there's a fenced brown shingle home at 2626 region. Peeking through the fence, we see that behind there is a small cottage, uh, which was formerly the garage uh, for this house. This was briefly the home of Theodore John Ted Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber. Kaczynski taught for two years at UC Berkeley, and here's his young man in front of Doe, Doe Library. Um, he was a brilliant mathematician uh, who was accepted into Harvard in age, at age 16. Um, and he was the youngest assistant professor who had been hired into UC math department at the time. 
uh, but he was not popular with students. Uh, he resigned suddenly after two years at UC. He eventually moved to a remote cabin um, in Montana where he learned how to live in self-subsistence self and he became disturbed by the environmental destruction he saw around him. Then between 1978 and 1995, he sent 16 homemade bombs to airlines, computer stores, and universities, killing three people and injuring 23. In 1995, he sent the media 35,000 word anti-technology manifesto, rife with clues that led to his capture and arrest. Um, he's still serving a life prison sent sentence in prison and continuing to write while in prison. The picture on the right is, is at the time he was arrested. Well, let's turn right on Parker and right again at Hillegas Avenue. Um, and we're now at the corner. Uh, we've come uh, from, our, uh, from our starting point here all along Regent. We've come to this point and we're now gonna head back on Hillegas Avenue. Um, on the uh, southeast corner um, is this house, which is the uh, Marshall uh, Limblom house. Um, and it is at 2601 to 03 Hillegas. Um, it is a Berkeley city landmark, um, a lovely colonial revival house that was designed by the architectural firm of Cunningham Bri uh, Brothers and completed in 1897, which is a fairly early colonial revival. We see this L-shaped porch, the I I Ionian columns, uh, the classical pilasters, the ornate brackets, these lovely oval windows next to the door. It all gives it an, an air of, of elegance. Um, it's now actually divided into two units as a duplex. Um, and it's been uh, pretty well maintained thanks to its uh, status as a landmark and the Mills Act, uh, which allows for uh, tax uh, benefits uh, for the uh, maintenance of historic homes. Well, continuing uh, right on Hillegas to Derby Street at the northeast corner is 2609, uh, 2601 Derby, uh, which was designed by Bernard Maybeck, uh, Berkeley's nationally renowned architect, uh, early in his career and completed in 1900. Um, Charles Keeler, who promoted simple homes without ornamentation in harmony with nature, supervised the construction. Um, it has lively massing or, or shape of the house um, an unusual third floor uh, balcony with windows above uh, French doors. Um, it has a very steep, almost medieval looking uh, roof. Um, and it's done in, uh, in shingles. Now the shingles have more recently been painted charcoal with white trim, uh, unlike the, the original form, which would have been uh, brown shingle. Well, let's cross Derby at the crosswalk and walk to the entrance of Willard Park. Um, it's faced by a pleasing row of homes along Hillegas and contains a grove of uh, large redwood trees in the, uh, uh, at the entranceway and a couple more uh, out in the park that we can see here. The city purchased um, and demolished homes in the 1960s to create the park. Um, and when it opened in 1971, during the Vietnam War, community activists opposing the war called it Ho Chi Minh Park. In 1982, the park was officially named in honor of Francis Willard a 19th century suffragist, educator, and temperance leader. Uh, neighborhood activists spearheaded various improvements during the 1990s, including the renovation of a busy tot lot. Uh, a few Latter day hippies hang out here, and its broad lawns and shade trees are, shade trees are popular with residents and, and families and people. Uh, dogs run around, people throw frisbees, there's informal soccer games, and so on. As we get to the end of the next block along Hillegrass, uh, at the, on the northeast corner with Stuart, there's 2747 Hillegas, uh, a George P. McDougal design from 1905, uh, featuring this round turret. Um, there's this oval, interesting oval windows here, um, uh, the nice uh, 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 mullions in the upper parts of the windows, um, and it's in this brown shingle again. Um, now, across on the uh, uh, be the northwest corner uh, is instead this building, which are the uh, roomy apartments. Um, and the uh, roomy apartments date from 1958. Um, for me, this is a object lesson in how not to do higher density in a residential neighborhood. Um, the uh, the six-story building over 
a, a garage uh, looks to me rather like uh, some tacky seaside uh, architecture. Um, and it, uh, it's, it's not only the style, but it's really out of scale, scale uh, with, with the neighborhood. Uh, we're gonna see some other examples of, of better uh, apartment building shortly. Well, as we proceed along Hillegas, um, there's a house that had a kind of Brazilian theme and all sorts of interesting signs and sculptures. Uh, unfortunately, just recently, I noticed there, there are considerably fewer. I don't know whether ownership changed or what. So um, there's still some things there, but it isn't quite as much fun as it used to be. Um, then at 28, um, 21 Hillegas, George Rushforth of Rush, Wright and Rushforth Architects designed the Hillegas Court Apartments in 1915 for G.A. Matern, who was a clothing manufacturer, um, who was reportedly inspired by illustrations of a European resort hotel. So for me, this is one of the most attractive apartment buildings in Berkeley with a variation of the roof, uh, the roof line, uh, lots of windows. Um, it's in a U shape around a landscape courtyard. There are three uh, ornate entrances, um, lots and lots of windows, as I said, uh, some of them in triplets with cutouts above. Um, there's also nice, some nice lattice work on some of the windows. And then the uh, parking garages are tucked nicely under the uh, two wings of the building. This one achieves high density and yet fits in very well uh, with the surrounding single family home neighborhood. Um, and it actually has 34 bedrooms. So it provides more uh, housing than the, uh, the, the, the six floor roomy apartments, which have 24 bedrooms. Well, as we go farther along at 28, 27 Hillegas is a 1905 brown shingle um, that has a tall roof uh, sweeping over a wide second floor dormer and a couple of small third floor dormers. Uh, the porch uh, features large brackets and then this clinker brick and clinker bricks are bricks that were generally kind of rejected from the kiln because they were a little too rough or blackened or something, but uh, craftsman designers love them for the rustic effect they give. Well then as we go farther along 28, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is across the street, 28, 28 Hill Guess. There's a 1909 house that combines some craftsman and Prairie School elements. Prairie School is the kind of horizontality of, of the design and the, the low roof. Um, it's also interesting, it has board siding on one floor, fl the upper floor and shingle on the other. And particularly interesting is all this outlining in wood of, of various features of openings of the building. Um, it's, it's really a pretty unique structure. Well, let's cross Russell Street and on the southeast corner of the intersection at 2901 Hillegas is an apartment building designed by James Playcheck, the, the guy who did the libraries in 1913. Um, there are some prairie school elements in this, uh, the horizontal, horizontal uh, features of the bands of windows. Um, it also has these nice, uh, fairly shallow bays and, and the detailing that it get, again gives it a fairly elegant look. So it, it fits very, again, fits very well into the neighborhood. Um, as an apartment building that offers generally more affordable housing than, than the big single family homes. Well, across the street from this um, is a, a simple brown shingle uh, that was the uh, final home of poet Ina Coolbrith at 2902 Hillegas. Um, she was California's first poet laureate and the first, po first poet laureate of any US state. Uh, she promoted the literary career of Walken Miller um, and served as Oakland City Librarian for 19 years, where she mentored Jack London, Isadora Duncan, and, and others. Um, her last years were spent here with her niece uh, in the mid-1920s, and she died in 1928, just before her 87th birthday. Um, there, um, you may know that on uh, Addison Street in the Arts District downtown Berkeley, uh, on the sidewalk, there are all these poems um, that somehow connected to Berkeley, uh, on, on metal plaques embedded the sidewalk. It's, it's quite fun to read some of them. The very first one uh, at, uh, near Shattuck Avenue is Ina Colver's poem about the California poppy. Um, she, um, for her day, when it was difficult to women to do th these things, um, she, she was quite a fascinating woman, uh, had a fascinating career, and, and there's a very good uh, biography of her that's out. Well, a little farther along, the, the left side of the, the well, the, the west side of the street, is lined with uh, some palm trees. There are three um, California 
desert fan palms and two Canary Island palms. Um, and the fan palms, which tend to, which grow in the near the desert springs, um, have these um, palm shaped fronds. Often the the old fronds hang down like a gray beard, and the the ends of the fronds remain on the tree. Um, the Canary Island palm also the ends of the fronds tend to remain on the tree, but it has much thicker trunks. And the uh, fronds are the kind we normally think of as uh, palm fronds that have uh, pinnate or leaves, which, uh, which means uh, feather, feather like leaves. Um, here's one more A Dodge Copland House, which is a 1906, uh, sort of craftsman style um, at 2920 Hillegas. Um, and uh, it has this uh, hip roof. There's these interesting uh, pointy mullions. There are these shelves under the small windows, which I'm not quite sure what they're for, but they're rather interesting. And there's a stepped uh, brick chimney going up. Well, we've come, although we've made uh, this kind of uh, loop here uh, all the way back to Ashby Avenue, and we've come then to Benvenue Avenue, uh, where we're going to turn left. And, uh, and proceed down Benvenue. But first, there's yet another A Dodge Copland House, a, a kind of bungalow in brown shingle um, that has these great big uh, brackets and a fairly interesting uh, stepped uh, chimney on it. There used to be a, a sign on the house that labeled it as Flotsam and Jetsam, but just recently the sign is gone. Maybe it's uh, changed ownership and gentrified too much, I don't know. Um, anyway, it's, it's the 1906 house. I'm sorry, it was a 1907 house. Um, well, down the block at 2905 Benvenue is a house designed by John Hudson Thomas, one of my very famous, uh, favorite uh, uh, Berkeley architects, and George T. Plowman, uh, who was his early partner. It has this half-hipped roof over the porch and again over the big two-story bay that looks like some sort of cap or hood. And it's an interesting combination of brown shingle, stucco, and, uh, and half timbering. Um, this is a 1909 house. Well, we're about to cross Russell and just there, uh, we can't miss this sort of bright yellow orange house that it's a little hard to see because of the shadow, but it has a very bright red doors as well. And it has this sort of funny little pop-up room on the third floor. I don't know if that's for, to enjoy the viewer or quite what it's for. Um, in any case, it's, uh, it's an interesting house. And then uh, just beyond that, on the other side of Hillegas, uh, I'm sorry, of Benvenue, um, is a house design, uh, is a house that has these uh, little roofs that flare out over the uh, porch and over this bay here that have sort of an oriental look to them and these interesting little curlicues. Now this house is um, in a, uh, the, the house itself, this squarish, whatever, and the way it's laid out, out is called American Foursquare, which is very typical of early 20th century houses. There's lots and lots of them in Berkeley and in many other cities in the US um, and they have, they have this square, square look. Um, the entry door is to one side where there's an entry hall. Uh, to the side of that is the living room. Behind that is the dining room. And then the kitchen is in the back, uh, going on back from the entry hallway. And the entry hallway then has a stair that goes up to three or four bedrooms on the second floor. Um, we'll continue along, there's a 1904 Colonial Revival House at 2823 Benvenue um, that has this appealing sort of asymmetry, a very nice um, Colonial Revival style uh, porch on the side with the front door set back. And then there's this bay here with the windows that is kind of halfway in between the first and second floor windows. So I said, well, this is where there's a landing. And the publisher of the book, when we were doing it said, well, how do you know that? And I said, well, because um, it's, you know, it's half, it was pretty common to do that. It's halfway between the first and second floor windows. Um, so it, and, and you know, it's near the entrance. So it just, uh, it makes sense to me that that was where there was a stairway, but I haven't been inside to absolutely confirm it. Then we come to a house that, that kind of stops us in our tracks. It's, wow. This is another house by A. Dodge Cop Copland at 2811 Benvenue, the Westenberg house, um, which is from uh, 1903. Um, and Westenberg, pictured here, was a minister who later became a very successful businessman. The house has these big gables, two big gables on the south side. This is the street side is here. And on the front, 
Um, it has a medium sized gable and then a small gable over the dormer. Um, it has again these little funny things that look like they're they fit together in a jigsaw puzzle at the end of the barge boards. Um, it has this uh, brown shingle and then wood on the lower floor and there's also stone and a brick chimney and it has a big side yard. This is double lot. Um, they're probably later edition, but there's pretty Art Nouveau uh, metalwork. Um, so it's it's this is I think this is the most impressive of a Dodge Copland's designs. Across the st street um, at 2812 Benvenue is a is a more modest uh, brown shingle house. Uh, but what's interesting about this house is uh, the inhabitant. Um, for a time, it was the home of noted 20th century painter Richard Diebenkorn. Uh, an abstract expressionist, but also part of the Bay Area figurative movement. His bridging of these artistic styles resulted in his most famous paintings, including the Ocean Park series. And that's one of the Ocean Park series here. Um, he actually, he lived and worked in Berkeley from 1953 to 1966. Then he uh, moved to Southern California uh, for a good number of years, but he returned to Berkeley late in life, uh, moving with his wife into this uh, brown shingle house um, and they also had another place up in, um, in Healdsburg. Um, he spent his final months in poor health, still sketching, uh, and passed away here in 1993. Uh, a little further along is another nice uh, uh, Berkeley Brown Shingle House. And I, I put this one in for the very impressive big white uh, plum tree, which, which may be blooming soon. I, I took this picture a few years ago, actually. Uh, a little further along is uh, 2733 Ben is another John Hudson Thomas design, one of the first uh, to use stucco. Um, it has this room that projects out to the front, an interesting uh, roof design. And then a particularly interesting feature is a window that's behind here, but I was able to get a, a, a close up view of it um, and see what an intricate window design it is. This is a 1909 house. Opposite that uh, is this big brown trickle place that was originally designed uh, by Ernest Cockhead, Cockhead in 1903 as a house. Um, it, it was subsequently expanded and from the 1930s um, it was a private school called the Bentley School. Uh, since 1969 uh, it has been the uh, academy, another private school, uh, that had an ownership change in 2014. Well we cross Derby Street, we turn right, we continue to 26 to 6, 67 to 2771 Derby an apartment building. Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham's home in the summer of 1971, as their relationship blo blossomed, but before their marriage or any hint of future political doings. According to the Berkeley Historical Plaque Project, during a summer break from Yale Law School, they shared the apartment of Hillary's mother's half-sister, Adeline Rosenberg. Hillary clerked for Oakland attorney Mel Bernstein while Bill hung out reading and exploring the area. So if you've been walking around the Elmwood in the summer of 1971, you might have seen them. Well, we walk back to Benvenue, turn right, and continue to the rather nondescript Brown Shingle apartment building at 2603 Benvenue, where the Symbionese Liberation Army, the SLA, kidnapped Patty Hearst on February 4th, 1974. Patty was the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, publisher of newspapers and builder of Hearst Castle in San Simeon, and the sensational crime in its aftermath enthralled the nation for years. As ransom, this SLA demanded that Patty's father do donate food to needy California families. Saying that her subsequent $6 million food donation was of poor quality, the kidnappers held Patty captive for 19 months. During that time, she was brainwashed and tortured and committed several crimes on behalf of the SLA, including armed bank robbery. She was ultimately captured and sentenced to 35 years in prison. After serving 22 months, her sentence was commuted by President Jimmy Carter, and then President Bill Clinton pardoned her in 2001. Well, across the street at 2600 Benvenue is the corner with Parker Street are the Lindblom Apartments designed by George Anderson, completed in 1911. This attractive building, which is a blend of Mediterranean and classical elements, is set amid trees and set amid trees and has rich ornamentation, um, including the, the little dentals here. Um, the dentals, um, it's, um, it's, it's these little things that look like teeth, but it's spelled with an I rather than an A. Um, there's also um, these geometric patterns here under the windows. Um, there are uh, floral patterns around the bay windows. Um, 
even the fence has this, uh, this fence comes later, but um, it has this nice inlays into wooden plaques set in the post and the spiral uh, metal uh, elements. So again, another very attractive apartment they're building that works well in a single family neighborhood. Um, then if we turn left on Parker, we see a three houses designed by Julia Morgan, which um, the middle house set back so that all three houses in, uh, face into a central open space area. Um, these were designed for one owner, but who uh, then sold off the three houses uh, speculatively. speculatively. Um, this house has been renovated in Julie Morgan's time, but the other windows uh, indicate that they uh, preserve their historic look. Well, now we go uh, back uh, up uh, Parker Street towards College Avenue and at the corner um, is a house that was um, the home of uh, playwright and novelist Thornton Wilder, who won Pulitzer Prizes for the off-performed play, Our Town, as well as for By the Skin of Our Teeth and for the novel, The Bridge of Sandoy Ray. Um, he lived on the Northwest corner at 29, 50, 2598 College as a middle school student in Berkeley around 1906 to 1910. Um, the house has been altered somewhat and it's now a fraternity house, but uh, much of the 19, 1898 historic residence remains. Um, and I found uh, also when he was in high school, he lived in another place in Berkeley near the stadium, but the, unfortunately the house is gone now. Um, he then went on to Yale and I don't know if he came back to Berkeley again, but we can claim something about Thornton Wilder anyway, he's a Berkeley high graduate. Uh, turning right on college, we walk to the Julia Morgan Theater. So uh, we've come all the way Benvenu. We're, we're working well around now. Uh, we're here at uh, College Avenue near uh, Derby Street, where the Julia Morgan Theater, uh, 2640 College, it's designed by Julia Morgan. And the building is a sterling example of the Beria Arts and Crafts design. Um, it was originally built for the, the St. John's Presbyterian Church, which is now up the block. Um, the complex includes, there's a, a fellowship hall over here, which is from 1908, the main sanctuary here from 1910, and beyond that is the uh, Sunday school from 1916. Um, so it's primarily done in redwood uh, planks and shingles, um, and the congregation did much of the constructions themselves to save on cost. It, it was a Presbyterian church. Uh, I grew up as a Presbyterian, and uh, they, it was founded in Scotland and they have a reputation uh, for not uh, spending money needlessly. Um, anyway, when the church moved to its current much larger location in 1960, a major effort was made to save the building, uh, which led to the formation of the Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association. Um, the building became a theater and there's other uses for other parts of the building, a good example of adaptive reuse. Let's walk on College Past Derby to see the newer St. John's Presbyterian Church across Oh, that's the, I'm sorry, that's the inside of the, of the historic Presbyterian church. It looks a little different now, but it has this exposed uh, rafters and so on. Well, if we walk a little further, we see the, the newer version of the St. John's Presbyterian church uh, from 1964. It's a modern design, but the, 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 uh, the unpainted wood and some of the other, and the, the big lawn and there's pergola and all, uh, makes it fit in well to the neighborhood. Well, let's backtrack to where the Julie Morgan Theater was and across the street, um, are the Danbert Apartments from uh, 1915. Um, and the building features uh, planter boxes, um, some interesting design elements and, and nicely done windows. Uh, another nice apartment building in the area. Well, let's continue up Derby Street. At 2716 Derby, the Berkeley Masjid or mosque um, was uh, purchased by the uh, current uh, mosque in uh, 2000 and they've gradually renovated and done a nice job of, of fixing up the building. Uh, it, it was originally in 1915, the 20th Century Club of Berkeley, one of many uh, women's clubs in Berkeley, including the, um, the City Club on uh, Durant Avenue and the Town and Gown Club on Dwight. Well, let's, uh, let's go left on Etna Street and farther along on the left side, there were two homes at 2618 and 2616 designed by Julie Morgan. Um, this, the, the latter one in 2616 is featured here. It's uh, ca called Dutch colonial style with this sort of roof that we might call a barn roof in brown shingles. And the, and the entryway is, is on the side. Um, in the next block, there's a whole row of colonial revival styles. Colonial revival was very popular at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and um, 
these have that same uh, American four square pair uh, uh, pattern that laid out. This one actually looks like it's been divided into a duplex. So in the next block on the right side uh, at 2515 Etna, is a charming uh, 1921 cottage that was designed by Bernard Maybeck. Um, it's set back amidst the trees and there's a fence and so, so it's hard to get a good photograph of it and you have to kind of peek over the gate or the fence, whatever, to see it. Um, but as part of it, there was a barn that, um, uh, that Maybeck uh, renovated into a studio. Um, and the original owner of the house, Cedric Wright, was a violinist and a photographer. Uh, he was a mentor for famous photographer Ansel Adams um, and he participated in 33 Sierra Club trips. So uh, the studio was popular for musical evenings and parties uh, for Sierra Club members in the 1920s and 30s. When we get to Dwight, we notice um, this place uh, across the street that has this interesting uh, varied design of, of shingles on, on the siding uh, on the front, on the uh, street side. Um, it's called Grill House. Um, and it's not gorilla, but gorilla. Um, it's a 12 bed, uh, room bed room residence for UC students. Um, and it dates back to 1891. Well, after turning right on Dwight, we go right on Piedmont Avenue. And farther along, we come to uh, Parker, where we go left to 2811, which is a well-restored Italianate cottage. Um, Italianate is part of before Victorian. This is from 1883. So it's quite old for this area. And, uh, you know, one of the oldest houses in this, in this neighborhood. Um, that features a fairly low roof, um, these particular kinds of, of brackets. Um, and often the windows would have uh, little arches at the top of the windows that may have been altered. If we go uh, just towards the end of the block, uh, across the street is the Clark Kirk campus of the University of California. This was originally though the California School for the Deaf and Blind. Um, the campus has Mediterranean style buildings designed mainly by George B. McDougall, who did that one uh, house we saw earlier, and Alfred Eichler. Um, who were both worked in the California Office of the State Architect. Um, the current campus was built in the 1920s, replaced an older Victorian building here. Uh, more buildings were added in the 1950s and then more recently became UC property. Well, let's return to Piedmont and go left. This large uh, 1902 brown shingle at 26, 25, 27 bin has twin gables and there's actually twin entrances. It's a duplex. Um, that's why it's, it has this sort of mirror image. Um, but also more interestingly, uh, the house was at uh, one point the home of David Park, a painter who was a co-founder of the Bay Area figurative movement, along with Richard Diebenkorn and Elmer Bischoff. And here's, here he is in his studio. Um, and this is one of his paintings called The Rehearsal. Supposedly, uh, this is <laughs> a slice of, of David Park's head as he's playing the piano. Um, and maybe Elmer Bischoff is one of the musicians. They used to get together and have various sessions. Um, well, across the street from this is a house um, at um, 2620 Piedmont uh, from 1905. It was constructed by a civil engineer and he used concrete blocks, but they look rather like stone. And he put this over um, reinforced uh, concrete, so it's a it's a very uh, early example of that uh, form of a very sturdy construction. So it should be okay in the earthquake, and it has a very interesting little roof here over the turret. Farther along, twenty six thirty Piedmont um, is a nineteen o five house. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, twenty six thirty is a, a nineteen uh, oh five yes nineteen o five house. This is another A Dodge Copland design. Um, that has interesting gables, a little funny little uh, circular window up here. Um, the columns kind of get narrow as they as they go up. Um, he really was an amazing architect, and one thinks every house seems unique. We, you really wonder if if he hadn't died at age thirty nine, you know, if he hadn't died early like Mozart, what, what, what we've done in his forties and fifties. Uh, well, we cross Derby Street and turn left to go to twenty eight fourteen twenty six Derby. These are a pair of houses designed by Julie Morgan that face each other. She did a lot of these pairs. We saw a trio early, but she did a lot of pairs as houses. They are sort of the same style, but different, different designs. And this one has this lovely ornate uh, ornamentation on the uh, uh, part over the, uh, the bay windows. Well, we go back to Piedmont and, and go left. Um, and when we uh, across Forest Avenue, um, it's uh, lined with large London plane or sycamore trees. These are out of uh, leaf, of course, 
Unfortunately, on one side, as happens on so many streets, they, the trees have been hacked to accommodate the utility lines, but still uh, when they're in full leaf, it creates a virtual tunnel over the street. A little farther along at the corner with Gerber Street um, is this uh, rare house, which is called Gothic Revival. I'm not sure why they call it Gothic Revival. It doesn't have what I think was Gothic windows, but it's from the 19th century. So along with that Italianate house, it's one of the oldest homes in the area. It has been renovated and, and, and added onto, but at least it has been nicely restored. If we look up to the left on Garber, we can see uh, there, there's a curving switchback that, that goes up here. So uh, it's kind of reminiscent of the, the part of Lombard Street in San Francisco, but here we don't have the hordes of tourists. Well, just beyond there are a number of large redwood trees that were planted in the uh, small uh, planting area between the curb and the sidewalk. It's not really the ideal tree. Um, they're, they're causing the sidewalk to buckle or just plain taking over the sidewalk. I mean, they're great trees, but maybe not the right place to put them. Well, we cross Stuart and turn right and then uh, continue just past Piedmont, which jogs here to uh, 28 Piedmont uh, on the corner and next to it, uh, 2732 and 2730 Stuart. These three residences were all designed by Leola Hall. Although not formally trained in architecture, from 1907, 1907 to 1912, she designed, developed, built, and sold a number of highly regarded craftsman style houses in Berkeley at a time when few women carried out such work. Um, ten of her designs are within a block of here, supposedly. She was also a painter and an outspoken suffragist. There were a lot of amazing women in early days in Berkeley. Um, well, here is a, a historical plaque. There, this area was formerly the Kelsey Ranch, which uh, I think more than ranch, it seemed more like it was a kind of uh, nursery with, a, with an orchard and ornamental plants. I want to, yeah, that's right, okay, sorry. I just wanted to show you, uh, okay, there's, uh, there it is. Oops. I wanted to show you this map. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, <laughs> we've come here and we've got only this little bit, another two couple blocks and we're back to the starting point. Um, but uh, I wanted to show you, we've, so we've, from the Julia Morgan place, we've done all of this bit now. Uh, we've come here, which is another very impressive house. Um, this one in uh, Spanish mission revival style. Um, and it has these swooping curves and tiles and uh, arches and it's quite an amazing house. This was actually based on a popular design in one of Henry L. Wilson's bungalow books. Now, bungalows are normally smaller houses than this, but in any case, um, this provided the illustrations and floor plans. So, well, people buy pattern books for clothing. They had pattern books for you to build your houses from. Um, it was a house from 1910. Um, the original owner was Edwin M. Marcus, who was a hardware store proprietor, but he became a busy developer in the Elmwood district after moving to Berkeley, he took out 151 building permits during the 1920s. The living room extends the width of the first floor. Um, and the house is also notable for stary, stately Canary Island palms. We could just see a bit of the Canary Island palms here. Um, and also it's on Russell Street, which gets closed off is like the place to be on Halloween. And this house has amazing uh, Halloween decorations and as well as uh, Christmas time decorations. Well, we turn back down Russell on Cherry Street, 2717 Russell on the Northwest corner was the family home when growing up of Elmer Bischoff, a leading painter in the Bay Area figurative movement. So he, he was, the, the three main ones uh, were considered Elmer Bischoff, Richard D. Bencorn, we saw earlier and, 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 and David Park. Um, and at one point they all lived at places in, uh, in the, uh, here in the Elmwood district within walking distance of each other. The house we showed earlier for, for uh, Diebenkorn was where he lived later in life. Earlier, before he went to LA, he lived in a bungalow in, the, uh, in another part of the Elmwood area. Um, in any case, um, Elmer Bischoff was, was both an art teacher and a painter. Um, the, the house we saw was designed and built by his father in 1919. Uh, Bischoff graduated from Berkeley High in 1935. And at one point, uh, Bishop Parker all lived within walking distance, I said, and they used to gather to sketch models, to talk and play live music. Um, and later on, uh, Elmer Bishop and his wife supposedly live uh, up above uh, in the second floor 
of this building, which for uh, 90 years, uh, I believe it was a drugstore, but there was, it was famous for Aussie soda fountain. Uh, then 1910, it became the uh, Elmwood Cafe and more recently uh, Baker and Commons, but it still has the Aussie soda fountain sign out there. Well, we're back to the uh, College Avenue Commercial District uh, and um, has more of these historic buildings. Um, we'll pass by some restaurants and stores to arrive back at our starting point. Uh, if we were really doing the walk, we could perhaps taste some local treats, but we'll have to content ourselves with whatever is in the kitchen after our long walk. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a walk in Berkeley Walks. Um, this is available from uh, local bookstores such as uh, Mrs. Dalloway's that's in the Elmwood, uh, Books Inc, Pegasus and other bookstores carry it. Um, also, if you'd like to get a second copy from Janet and me, um, you can contact us via our website at www.berkeleywalks.com or just Google Berkeley Walks. Um, the uh, website also features um, some new walks. Um, in addition to 21 walks in this book, um, I've done another uh, 18 walks. They're divided into six series of three each and they're PDFs which are downloadable for free. Uh, we're venturing mostly in Berkeley, but we're venturing a little bit into Kensington, Albany and North Oakland. Um, and uh, I'll be adding more walks, uh, but they're PDFs. Um, uh, unlike the book where we had to worry about printing costs, um, the maps and photos are all in color. They're, they're laid out in a similar fashion. Um, and you can uh, either print them out yourself or you can uh, upload them, use them on just about any device, whether a, a tablet, a, a laptop or a smartphone. Um, anyway, um, this concludes our presentation. Um, I've been on the Greenbelt Board a long time. I think the, the work, the, the, the organization is doing tremendous work. Um, we're, we're focusing now on resilience uh, to, uh, to climate change and uh, that still involves uh, protecting key areas of our Bay Area Greenbelt um, and making our cities more livable uh, and resilient places. Um, so at this point, uh, hopefully we can open up to uh, questions. Uh, we're, we're right at 11, but uh, you know, I'm willing to stay on uh, for anybody who'd like to ask some questions. Yeah, we didn't have any come in during the presentation, so you, you must have really been capturing attention. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask in the chat or there, I think there's a Q&A function. Um, and note again that this presentation was recorded and will be sent out to everyone who registered for this event later today. Uh -huh. All right, looks like maybe we have one here. Uh, okay, from Nancy, Bob, did Julia Morgan live in the area? Uh, Julia Morgan lived uh, mostly in Oakland, but, um, and she had an office at one point in San Francisco, I know, um, but she, she went to uh, um, UC Berkeley and then Maybeck encouraged her to go to the um, Academy des Beaux-Arts in Paris where she was the first woman to be admitted. She had to dress herself as a man and but uh, when she eventually passed the test, they, they debated, but they decided to let her in. Then she came back to the Bay Area where she practiced for many years. And um, she lived in Oakland, but she did a lot of work in Berkeley, uh, a lot of buildings in Berkeley. Great. And I think she's buried in the Oakland, uh, what is it called, Mountain View Cemetery? I think so. Okay. Um, well, I don't see any more questions coming in. A lot of gratitude for the very informative and interesting presentation. Well, thank you. There's a few things in here that aren't in the book and there's a few things in the book that aren't in today. So, uh, but it's basically um, founded on that uh, walk in the, in the Berkeley Walks book. Great. Okay. Um, well, how many, how many people did we have join us at the, at the peak? I caught 71 total. Okay, so great. Great turnout. Yeah. Thanks Thank to everyone for joining us this Saturday morning. Um, look for an email in your inbox later today. Um, and that will include the link to the recording. And if for some reason you don't get that email, you can go to our website um, where we also post our email or our, the videos. So um, great. 
the way you'll find it. <laughs> Thank All you right. very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone.